are looking at the elements of negligence, but the first element of negligence, which is uh, a duty of care. The first thing we look at before we understand whether someone was negligent or not is whether there was a legal duty of care. And you remember we talked about it, and, uh, and in the last class we said you can actually be as careless as you want as long as you owe no duty of care to another person. You remember that? So the first defense someone is normally going to bring is that I did not owe a duty of care to that person, so why should I be held uh, liable in negligence? So that means duty of care is the first step before you find out whether someone was negligent or not. Now, in establishing a duty of care, from the cases of Donahue versus Stevenson and the case of Grant versus Australian Hill, which we dealt with in the last class, we found that Lord Atkin developed what we call the neighbor principle, or what is also referred to as the Atkinian duty of care. Before you establish liability or where the duty of care was owed, you must show that there was a relationship between the person who suffered the injury and the person who did the wrong act. You get it? That is how in Donahue versus Stevenson, the manufacturer was linked to the final consumer. Uh, this link is necessary uh, because it creates the relationship when someone can be compensated for injuries or whether he should not be compensated for injuries. In the case of Hedley Bryan versus uh, Heller, I, may, I might have mentioned it in the last case, in the last class. Uh, in that case, people sought advice from the bank whether they should give money to a certain person because that person had been banking with, the, with that bank. And the bank carelessly gave the information. It did not verify it. And uh, courts found that in this case, a proximate relationship had been created between the bank and the people who sought the information because the bank knew why that person was seeking for the information. It is like uh, someone who, a bank asking for, uh, let's say, Uganda Revenue Authority, searching for the ownership of a vehicle. You suspect that at least there should be a reason why maybe they want to base it to, to give a loan or something. So a relationship is created. However, you have to note that in this case of uh, Headley Bind versus Heller, the bank included a clause that with uh, this information is being given without responsibility on the part of the bank. So there was a proximate relationship, uh, there was a duty of care, but uh, the bank excused itself with that clause. Uh, and that is how courts addressed the issue of whether a relationship had been created or not. Now, the relationship has, the neighbor relationship has to be reasonable, a bit reasonable. It has to be something which you look at and say, yeah, really, something must have happened between these two people. And this person should have owed the duty of care to the other person. And uh, you look at the circumstances. For example, if you look at the case of Home, o home Office versus Dosset TH Company, you look at the case in your notes. This is a case where one company was in charge, well, uh, the Home Office was in charge of juveniles, and the, defendant, the, the plaintiffs at that time, Dosset TH Company, were operators of boats, you know, and the home office failed to look after the children or the sports children and they managed to escape, went, got stole a boat from the Dosset Church company and they got involved in an accident. And then they were asking them, Where was home office liable? Was it negligent? It should have foreseen. It had delinquent children, people who were already at odds with the law. Uh, it's bringing them, it's not looking after them. The, the officers slept or whatever happened. But they managed to let the children escape. They should have known that something like that could, could, uh, could happen if they're not careful. And there was a relationship between them and the final injury that occurred. So or the home office became part of or a neighbor to uh, Dosset Church Company became a neighbor to home office in that case, and they were held uh, liable. So the case, the duty of care has been somehow expanded, of course instead of just being a neighbor, looking at whether someone was a neighbor or not, it has expanded further to cover uh, other aspects of uh, incidences where someone can be held liable. I wanted you to look at the case of Caparo versus Dickman. Caparo uh, versus Dickman. Uh, you will you look at it in the notes, I'm, uh, which I'm, I'm referring to. Uh, and in that case, court held that it was not easy to use only one test to determine whether 
someone is liable or not. You can't rely on the neighbor principle alone. alone. You have to look at other considerations. And in this case, they say you have to look up. In addition to the neighbor principle, you have to consider proximity, the relationship between the two people. You have to consider um, uh, uh, whether, uh, apart from proximity, you have to consider whether it is just and fair for that person to be found liable. And then you also have to consider whether uh, considering policy, you have to make policy considerations to determine whether someone was, should be held liable or not. And it's important because all these together help you to determine whether someone was liable or had the duty of care or not. Yeah. So to establish whether the duty of care exists or not, the, the first consideration normally a court will look at is whether there was reasonable foreseeability. To owe a duty of care, you must have reasonably foreseen that what you're doing or omitting to do could cause injury or loss to another person. And it's the, those are the terms. Reasonable foreseeability. You should reasonably foresee my actions can cause this, they're likely to cause harm or not. Like in Donahue's case, court said the manufacturer should have reasonably foreseen that by leaving bottles in a storage place open for over a month, in a dark storage place open uh, for a whole month, and the bottles are opaque, he should have foreseen that there's a chance by the time he puts his product in the bottle, something could have happened since there was no second chance to wash them or whatever, or inspect them. Uh, and that was the possibility. In the case of Grant versus Australian Hill, court said the manufacturer of those underwears which had sulfuric uh, sulfur contents should have foreseen that putting a content, a new content in the in the product, could possibly cause such an injury to people because they had not tested it. You get it. So there's some kind of reasonable foreseeability. Um, in Uganda, we had the case of there are many cases, of course. But we had, for example, we had the case of Omoni versus Attorney General. Uh, in this case, there were thieves, people were smuggling things, uh, and then um, a soldier, while chasing them, shot towards them, the smugglers, when they ran into the crowd, and he injured other people who were not the smugglers. And then the person sued. And now the question was should the policeman have foreseen that by firing bullets in a crowd, in a busy area, he could miss his target and hit unintended persons. And the thing court found that yes, you could the plan, the defendant should have known or the police officer should have known that something like that could happen. You can foresee even if you're the best shooter in the world, you're chasing someone and the person is running in the crowd, there's a high chance you may shoot him, miss, or you may shoot him, the bullet passes through him and hits another person. So these are the considerations. And they're saying it only should be a reasonable uh, foreseeability. Court in this case held that uh, proving breach of a duty is usually, you can usually do it by the plaintiff showing, producing evidence that shows that there was unreasonable conduct in those circumstances in the midst of foreseeable risks. Have you got it? The plaintiff has to adduce evidence that the conduct of the defendant was unreasonable in the face of foreseeable risks. That's what the uh, uh, court held. Um, reasonable foreseeability is important because it also determines whether the, the defendant should have seen, should have known what could happen or not. If you look at the case of Nova Mink versus uh, Trans-Canada Airlines. Nova Mink versus Trans-Canada Airlines. This was an, an airline, the different airline flew a bit low and uh, apparently the farm of the plaintiff, he was, he had a farm which had mink, there are certain kinds of animals were, which they used to to get fur, fur coats. Yeah, they're called mink. So the animals got frightened and they ate their young ones and this person sued the the company. So the question was, should the airline have foreseen that by flying low at that time, uh, how would they have known that it was a mating season? How would they have foreseen that the animals would react that way? You know, it was not even a well-known farm. How would they have known that it was a farm of mink? You get it? So in this case, the reasonable foreseeability test came into question. They were saying, what should the defendant have foreseen? What should he have known? And was it fair for you to say that you should have foreseen that or not? Um, also, the, te the extent of foreseeability matters. It's not that you should foresee everything, you know? 
you can't say that uh, you foresee that uh, if someone slides and falls, he's going to break his leg. When he breaks his leg, he's going to go to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, there might be an accident. Uh, then after the accident, he might be treated badly by the doctor. You know, there has to be some kind of extent of possibility of what can happen. You get it? If you look at the case of Pearl's Graph versus Long Island Railway Company, uh, someone, the plaintiff was standing on the railway line, uh, on the rail station, with, uh, with, with her daughter, daughters waiting to board a train. And then there was someone who was trying to board. And then the soldiers tried, uh, sorry, the guards helped him to board. And he had something in his bag. It slipped out, fell. It was a firecracker. And um, uh, it, it hit. The, the thing exploded. I mean, there was a coin-operated machine, which also uh, something came out and hit the plaintiff. And now they are suing that this person, should have, they should have foreseen that doing some, something like that could cause such an injury. Court held that this was too far-fetched. You could not reasonably foresee that by helping someone to board a plane, sorry, to board a train, um, something could fall out of his bag and then it would cause such an injury. It was a, it was really far fetched. You get it. So it has to be reasonable for stability. Like if you look at the case of Ntebe Kaine, Ntebe Kaine versus uh, Umeme, Ugandan case, uh, there were wires, electricity wires, which were hanging. There, there were wires which passed, and these two even spark on windy days. So one time they sparked and caused the fire. And this person sued Umeme and he said, we should have foreseen that by leaving these wires hanging close, there was a chance that they could cause a fire. And it, it indeed happened. So the fire was caused by faulty lines and it was reasonably foreseeable. It was reasonably foreseeable that such an injury, such damage could occur if the defendant, Umeme, did not um, uh, secure the wires to make sure that they are, they are safe. Yeah. So after reasonable foreseeability, the next thing you look at is proximity. Proximity refers to, it's also like a neighbor principle, but it's proximity is being close to each other. And this can be physical proximity. You can say the act, the act occurred uh, when the plaintiff and defendant were present. It can be circumstantial proximity because of that act. Uh, we can say that they, they were they were linked together by the by the act or omission. It can also be causal. You can say it was because of that thing that the risk that the final injury occurred. Uh, proximity somehow was important because uh, it shows that if someone does something carelessly or negligently and it causes injury to another person, then if if you prove that there was proximity between them, then you should the a duty of care was should have been found uh, to exist. You look at the case of Jesk versus Coffee. Jesk, I don't know how you pronounce it. Jesk versus Coffee. In that case, uh, Jesk drove negligently and caused injury to the to Coffee. And when in hospital, his wife, Coffee's wife, saw the injuries and then got traumatized and things like that. And the question was, did Jesk owe a duty of care to the wife? I'm driving my car. Uh, do I owe a duty of care to everyone, including their wives at home? and children, uh, where does is, there should be a limit. But in this case, court agreed with the woman uh, uh, because, of course, we'll talk about policy considerations later on. But court found out that there was a proximity between the accident and the injuries suffered because, as a wife, she had the right to react like that. And also, you know, travel, driving negligently, you should know, obviously, foresee. But if you cause injury to another person, someone who is related to them, unless you think that uh, no one has anyone who cares for them, uh, there should be a, a presumption that someone will be affected by your actions. So courts raise those things and say there are three kinds of relationships which are fulfilled. One, proximity, being in physical, proximity, being at the scene. In this case, the woman wasn't at the scene. Two, circumstantial proximity in terms of the relationship between the parties between the wife and the person who finally uh, caused the uh, accident. I mean, there is causal proximity that the defendant's act, act was the one which caused the injury. So, of course, the, the defendant driving badly, 
is the one which caused the injuries to the to the wife. Yeah. So after proximity, the next thing you look at with the duty of care is policy considerations because uh, there are times when it may not be right to create a duty of care. You know, like for example, if two thieves went to uh, to steal. And one of and they are trying to shoot the door open, to shoot the lock open, and the other one shoots when the other one is nearby. The bullet bounces off and hits the other one. That thief can't come and sue the fellow thief in a court of law for injuries, can he? You know, I will say we went, we were stealing together, and this person did not exercise the duty of care to make sure that he shoots the padlock and doesn't injure me. It wouldn't, it wouldn't augur well at all. Would no court would be willing to hear that case. Because of policy considerations, it would mean that first of all they will find you liable for theft or armed robbery, whatever it will be, and then at the same time they are saying that there was a legal duty owed to, to to make sure that when you're doing your armed robbery, you don't injure your partner. Court can't do that. So you look at the case of Gala versus Preston, uh, where two people were intoxicated, two youths, young people were intoxicated. They entered into a car, stole a car, drove it, got injured. Now. One was suing the other, saying they owed a duty of care to them. And court found that they could not find such a duty of care because the accident was caused by uh, the other one being intoxicated, but both of them were involved. They both decided to steal the car, and they were doing an illegal act. So they couldn't say it was legal on one hand, and again held them liable in, in the criminal case. You had to harmonize to get it. So that is how policy considerations are. Also... Um, in the case of Nego, Nego versus Rotnest Island Authority, uh, you, you see it also somewhere in, in your notes, uh, court has to consider the facts of each case to determine whether in this case they should be duty owed. In the case of Nego, they were, the, the, the defendants were in charge of um, like a resort where, where people go and have fun, you know, like how you go to Nino Beach or Mulungu, whatever it is. And they were in charge of that place. This place had a safe place for swimming and it had a dangerous place for swimming. Now, when this when Nego went to swim, when the plaintiff went to swim, he saw a place which was elevated. It looked like it was a diving platform. And he decided out of his stupidity or foolishness, foolishness, he decided to go jump over that edge into the water. He banged his head, of course, and got injured. And now he was suing them, saying, you should have told us you owe the duty of care to me and other beach goers to warn us that this place is not right for diving. Of course, the defendant was saying, how can we be responsible? How do we owe a duty of care to a, need, to a uh, not an idiot, but a foolish person? Courts use the word fool, fool had someone who is foolish doing a very careless act. But still it was held that the respondent had brought itself in a relationship of proximity with the visitors because it was in charge of the place. Therefore, whatever happened on that place, it was supposed to be in charge and foreseen. Uh, secondly, the ledge looked like it was something which could be dived off from. So they owed the duty of care to warn them and say, do not dive from this part. Something can happen to you, even as stupid as it sounds. Uh, and three, the kind of injury that could occur uh, and the likelihood that a sign could deter that injury was was also considered. God said something like bad would happen, and a sign, just a simple sign, was enough to to stop it. And also, uh, other factors could be used um, to, to to find the relationship between the person who did the act and the final injury. Now, you've seen these things. You go to the beach and find do not swim, be aware of crocodiles, you know, be aware of sharp rocks, things like that. That is part of the of the thing that has developed over time. So now you owe a duty, you know, to warn people. You may go to to Munyonyo, I've been to Munyonyo, and the water is right there. If you want, you can swim. But then they put a signpost and say, danger, do not swim. Or they put something like, uh, be careful of sharp stones, or watch out for uh, deep or sudden the ending, you know, because the, of the way the place was constructed. All this is trying to exercise that duty to at least to warn you so that the person will not be sued in case something has not happened. So if you look at all these things together, you'll find that in, if you want to determine whether the duty of care exists or not, 
you're going to look at the neighbor principle, whether this person has been brought into a neighborhood, a neighbor relationship with uh, the plaintiff and the defendants in a neighbor relationship. Two, uh, you look at reasonable foreseeability. The person should have foreseen that his acts or omissions could cause injury. Three, there was proximity uh, between uh, the parties. And four, that uh, you consider policy while making the decision. So when you do all this, is now when you know that there was a duty of care owed or not. And that is what it is um, in summary. Uh, other aspects, you look at them generally, how the law has developed in terms of uh, interpreting the tests of the duty of care. And I'm going to stop there for now uh, so that I, I, I do the next session.